Hello Year 10 and welcome back to Act 4, Scene 1. I just want to say a quick thank you to those of you who've already messaged me saying that um, this is really helpful and you appreciate it. I really do appreciate as well hearing you say that it's helping you. It makes it a lot more um, worth it and beneficial for me to be doing and I'll carry on doing it. So thank you for that feedback. Um, right, Act 4, Scene 1. As you can see, it starts with thunder and the three witches um, seeing a theme here. So I'm going to put at the top, which you can as well. This is on the top of page 61. Um, it doesn't have a page number, so just look at the page number before. So 61, pathetic fallacy again. You're going to put in capital letters, which is the running theme of the witches. And on your play, it says that they're with a cauldron. So they are casting spells. And this pretty much parallels Act 1, Scene 1. Because it links exactly how Act 1, Scene 1 started. It's almost like the brewing again of a new prophecy or a new something anew is going to happen to further the plot. Okay, let's see what these witches are up to. Thrice the brindled cat have mewed, thrice and once the hedge pig whined, Harper cries to time to time. So animals crying, negative atmosphere, Casting spells, all very witchy, showing their power. Round about the cauldron go in the poisoned entrails throw, toad the under cold stone, days and nights of thirty one, swelter venom, sleeping got, boil thou first in the charmed pot. So again, chanting spells, re establishing their power, chanting spells, re establishing power. Oh, miss me. Re-establishing power. Sorry, I had to put a hyphen in there. Um, okay. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. So lots of double, done double, bent over double. Double is like a motif that we've seen Macbeth and Aunt Beth also use the witch's language with the word double. Being duplicitous. Some of you have been talking about being that two-faced is a double trait. We can have duplicitous. Um, God, I'm hoping you can spell that. Perfect. Duplicitous. Sorry, bad typer. Uh, this idea of double, two-faced, double charge was Macbeth and Banquo at the beginning of the play. There was two of them. Um, she says a lot of done doubles. Uh, Lady Macbeth throughout the play, there's a lot of double nature in the play, which could all come from the witches if you believe that your main argument would be that the witches have manipulated this entire storyline. That's a good uh, level of analysis to put in. Billet of fenny snake, in the cauldron bowl and bake, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble like a hell broth boil and bubble. I would just highlight all of the animals listed here. We've got a lot of animal imagery, potentially to do with the evil. Double, double, toil and trouble, so we've got uh, repetition here. Fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. So very much they are powerful witches casting spells. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witches, mummy, more, and gulf of the raven sea, salt sea shark, root of hemlock, digged in the dark, liver of blaspheming Jew, gall of goat, and sips of yew, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of turk and tartar's lip, finger of bear, strangled babe, ditch livered by a drab, make the gruel thick and slab, and there to a tiger's chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. So you might have just turned over to page 63 and seen there's a big picture there of the witches casting this spell. So that's just a theatre production in 1995. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, cool it with a baboon's blood and the charm is famine good. They are evil witches. All of this sounds very gruesome, gory, um, killing these animals, just evil witches and their fully establishing power. That's all I can say, really. Right. Here, Kate, Queen of the Witches, she comes back. Here she is. We already know her. We've already said in our annotations at the end of Act 3, Queen of the Witches or Goddess of the Witches, she's back. And she says, oh, well done. Ooh, their spells that they've casted have been great. She's loved them. I commend your pains and everyone shall share in the gains. And now about the cauldron sing like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. There's another music piece and song called Black Spirits. No idea how that would go, but they're, they're absolutely jamming out to Black Spirits. 
By the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Open lock, whoever knocks. Ooh, someone's coming. Or something wicked as well. Now, if you've been looking at the PowerPoint that we've posted on Google Classroom, the annotations that I'm doing now are on that PowerPoint as well, but I'm just talking you through them if you need this. Um, this might take me over 15 minutes, but we'll see. Wicked. Uh, that is describing Macbeth. So that's interesting. That he is wicked. So perhaps he's now associated with evil because he keeps associating himself with the witches. Right. And this knocking again. Remember the Porter speech? Knock, knock. Um, he is knocking metaphorically into the scene again. Enter Macbeth. Right, here we go. Macbeth, Macbeth, it's been a while. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? So we've got a triplet here, some nice adjectives. Showing us that these witches are evil. And he knows it, he's happy that they're secret, they're black and midnight hags. What is it you do? So he's curious here, that interrogative question. On what they're up to um, is it that he trusts them is it that he wants to be in on what they're doing does he feel now part of them because he has turned to the evil and he has lost um his pathway into heaven he's lost that he's given up he's jumped the life to come if you remember that quote from his soliloquy he's given that up perhaps he's now on their their level a deed without a name Ooh, the evil right I conjure you by that which you profess. Look how demanding this is. However you come to know it, answer me. So, Macbeth, demanding answers from the witches, trying to take control. I would absolutely love he Kate to come back into the scene or Hecate and they have like a battle off on who controls the witches, but that doesn't happen. So Macbeth, um, Macbeth, Shakespeare was not willing to write that, but there you go. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on their warders' heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's germ and tumble altogether, even till destruction sicken, answer me to what I ask you. So these are all the things you could be getting up to. Um, I'm willing to risk everything that you could possibly do to me. So these are all the sort of things that the witches could, the witches could um, curse or cause to happen. Macbeth will risk it all to um, gather more information about his destiny. So he'll go through it all, answer me. And this repetition of answer me, answer me. He has to know, so he's desperate to know. Answer me. It's up to you here. Do you think he's powerful or weak? Is it that he's powerful in terms of taking control of the witches? Or does it show a slight weakness in that he, he has to know to carry on? Um, otherwise, he won't know what's going to happen to him. And he keeps seeing Banquo's ghost. So he's been haunted and there are now suspicions because he's acting like this weaker person in front of his nobleman and king's guard. The first which says, speak, demand, we'll answer. So they're going to tell him, say if thou would rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. So do you want to hear it from us or do you want us to like summon it from, from the, the supernatural place where it can come out of our cauldron? Very, very dramatic. Call them, let me see them. So again, not scared of this danger, will even allow other um, unearthly spirits to show him his future. The first witch, and this is what's important, brought in um, a sow's blood, so pig's blood, that have eaten her nine farrow, grease that's sweating from the murderer's gibbet, throw into the flame. Ooh. Come high or low, thyself in office definitely show. Now, here is what you categorically have to know about Act 4, Scene 1. And I was clapping my hands together there, even though you can't see me because it's that important. Right. First thing. This is the first apparition. Make sure it's highlighted in your play. Make sure you know this is the first new prophecy that Macbeth is given um, at this moment, which is an armed head. Now, on the bottom of page 64, you have a picture of the armed head in your, in your book, in your play. You've got, you can see it. That's what comes out of the cauldron magically. 
Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thought, hear his speech, but say thou not. So the, the armed head that you can see in your booklet now on the top of page 65 says this. Macbeth, 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 beware Macduff. Beware the fane of Fife, dismiss me enough. So it's in a rhyming couplet. I'm actually going to put that in red because it is that important. Um, so beware Macduff is the first prophecy. Make sure you highlight beware Macduff. And in my play on the top page 65, I've put a number one next to it because it's the first thing. He has to beware this person. Now we know that this person didn't go to the banquet. And he also has run off to England and Lennox and that Lord were talking about it. Um, so he's a traitor. And now Macbeth is being told to beware him. So he's also the Thane of Fife. Don't forget that because that will become important later on. And I will reference that. So Macduff is the Thane of, of Fife. God, that's a tongue twister. Just like um, Macbeth was Thane of Cawdor. So it's a place that they are sort of looking after and ahead of. Make sure you remember that dismiss me enough so he disappears after that rhyming couplet so that's the first new thing Macbeth now knows he says whatever thou art for thy good caution thanks thou hast harped my fear aright but one word more like ooh, okay I need to be careful of Macbeth I want to know more so he's determined to talk to this e evil determined to talk to this evil and can't get away from it one word more he wants more um, he will not be commanded. Here's another more potent than the first. So here's the second apparition. Very important. New prophecy alert. Number two. And it's a bloody child. Mm, love that. Second apparition. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Again, it's all said in threes. And there's three witches. Three is a, is a magic number. Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. Wow, full of the jokes there, Macbeth. Be bloody, bold and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Right, um, some of you talked about this right at the beginning of Macbeth when we introduced you to the, pop the context. Some of you know that he is now told, and write this next to the line 78 to 80, no one born of a woman can harm Macbeth. Now remember the witch is talking riddles and some of you already know that riddle and I'm going to put in brackets here, no one born naturally, so a natural birth. Now we have, we have a lot of unnatural births, especially in this day and age where we can um, give birth early, there can be certain altercations and all of you will be probably shouting at your screens like, oh yeah, cesarean way. Um, you're cut from the mother's uh, stomach to get the baby, which isn't natural, which could be the catch. But no one born of a woman can harm Macbeth. And that descends. So Macbeth now is like, oh, then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? Um, why should I kill him now? No one can kill me. No one born of a woman can kill me. So he takes it very literally and is saying, well, I don't need to worry. No worries. Um... I am invincible, pretty much. No one can kill me. So why should I bother? And then he just says that rhetorical question. And then it's like, wait, but yeah, I'll make assurance, double short, that word double again, and take a bond of fate. Thou shalt not live. I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. So he's like, oh, I don't need to kill Macduff. Actually, just to make sure, I will kill Macduff anyway. Um, which again shows his evil nature, this ruthlessness that's coming out of Macbeth right now. Make sure you've got that annotated. And then we get the third apparition. I'm going to start the third apparition on my part two of Act 4, Scene 1. So I'll leave it there. Make sure you get annotations of the first prophecy and the second one. So this, these, uh, what's the word? These apparitions that are appearing in front of him. And I'll move on to the third one in part two.